Welcome, and thank you for attending today's FASD learning session. Our theme this year is prevention. We opened the season this fall with a presentation by Nancy Poole, who challenged us to think about what we know about prevention and whether we're actually doing it. Today, Dr. Jacqueline Pye and Dr. Carmen Rasmussen will discuss the use of technological innovations and interventions with individuals with FASD. Before you introduce Dr. Pye and Dr. Rasmussen, there are a few housekeeping tips. You can ask questions during the presentation by using the question and answer module on the right-hand side of your screen. A session facilitator is monitoring the questions and will pose them at suitable times during the presentation. If we aren't able to answer all questions during the live presentation, we will answer them via email after the session is over. It is important that you include your email address when you ask a question, otherwise we will have no way to send you an answer. The presenter's contact information will be found at the back of your handouts and on the final slide of the presentation. In order to receive your certificate of attendance, you must have signed in after 8.50 this morning. Evaluations for this session will be emailed to you after the session. Please fill them out and return them. We rely on your feedback to continually improve what we do and how we do it. Today's presentation and handouts will be posted for viewing and downloading on the FASD Alberta website, fasd.alberta.ca. If you experience any technical issues, please email support at cmgcanada.ca. Also, please let your local tech support know as the problems may originate at your end. As Alberta advances with the FASD 10-year strategic plan, education and training continue to play a key role. This is our fifth year of offering sessions and our second year of delivering the material as webinars. As always, all sessions are taped and made available on the CMC website, fasd-cmc.alberta.ca. We are pleased with the ongoing interest and attendance in this initiative. We appreciate the work of CASA, Child Adolescent and Family Mental Health, and the Alberta Centre for Child, Family and Community Research in making this initiative a success. Now I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Pye and Dr. Rasmussen. Dr. Jacqueline Pye is a registered psychologist specialing in neuropsychological assessment and is an assistant professor in educational psychology at the University of Alberta. She is also a member of the Glenrose Rehabilitation Hospital diagnostic team. Dr. Carmen Rasmussen is an assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics and member of the Center for Neuroscience at the University of Alberta. She is also a research affiliate at the Glenrose Rehabilitation Hospital. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Pai and Dr. Rasmussen. Good morning and thank you very much. It's great to have everybody here today. I'm just scrolling through slides in the wonderful world of technology. There we go. Hi. Um, so today, as by way of an overview, uh, Carmen and I are going to discuss a few different things. I want to start by talking to you a little bit about why we're discussing technology and what um, the theory and the sciences behind our understandings of the use of technology for understanding and responding to the needs of any kind of population, particularly those with complex needs. Um, we'll also look a little bit at how technology is used in intervention with other populations. So we'll say a couple of things about what we've learned from looking at other populations and then how we've taken that learning to how we work with the FASD population. When we're talking about use of technology with FASD, we'll talk a little bit about how um, technology is helping us inform diagnostic practices, how it's helping us better understand the population, and then how it's helping us to provide better supports and services for this group. We'll then think about how the information that we have to date and how the ideas, the theory and the science and the knowledge to date is informing our next steps forward. And finally, we'll conclude by discussing a little bit about how technology can also be a communication device and how use of technology for communication purposes 
also provides us with a great way to um, enhance the systems of support and services that are provided to this population. In terms of why technology, there are three ways that I want to look at it. Um, technology really can be um, uh, looked at for its advantage in terms of the way it responds to the, our understanding of the brain and the science that tells us about how the brain works, uh, around how learning theory tells us about how we learn, as well as motivation theories that tell us a little bit about what motivates us to try learning. So on all three levels, I'm going to talk a little bit and say that these three different fields of sort of the brain understanding, the learning understanding, and motivation understanding all tell us the same sort of thing about what helps us to best learn and best develop new behaviors and new abilities to function in complementary ways. And that all three of these say the same sort of thing, and that when we respond to what these three theories and ideas say, we can best meet those needs through the use of technology. So one of the first theories that we talk about, um, or one of the first, first approaches, is um, that of brain and what we understand about how the brain works. And one understanding that we have for that is experience-dependent neuroplasticity. What that means is experience-dependent is just what it says. It's dependent upon experience, neural brain cells, plasticity, plastic as in change. So experience-dependent neuroplasticity really gets after the idea that with a certain amount of very specific experience, the brain and the way the brain works can change. It's plastic. It's, there's an ability for it to change. It does this with four different conditions being met. One is repetition, time, intensity, and salience. Repetition means that in order for that brain to optimize the experience or make best use of the experience that it's getting, there needs to be sufficient repetition. Something has to be repeated over and over again. There needs to be repeated over a sufficient amount of time. So learning is a process. So it can't just happen quickly. It needs to happen over time. And that repetition needs to occur. Um, and, and that time is... Uh, both within the time you're doing it, so that 30-minute time period that maybe you're engaged in a task, as well as how many days in a row that you're engaged in that task, how many days in a week, how many weeks, how many months that you're doing it. The more time that you engage, the more that learning is going to take place. Intensity is another area. Intensity means that it's the right level of difficulty. So if something is too easy or too hard, I'm not going to learn at the very best. I need to kind of hit that sweet spot of learning where the intensity is just hard enough that I'm having to work at it a little bit, but not so hard that I'm willing to give it up and sort of throw it out. And so finding that sweet spot of intensity also in terms of neuroscience is telling us that's what gets those brain cells um, activated and functioning in the way that best supports learning and, and new connections. And salience is that the stimulus sets, uh, stands out. What that means is that that area that I'm targeting, that I'm trying to get that change in, is very specific, is very targeted and focused. So I like to compare this to, say, working out. Let's say I want to build a muscle. And let's say I want to build my bicep. Um, if I'm going to do that, I'm going to go to the gym and I'm going to start lifting weights. And when I'm lifting those weights, I'm going to have to lift them and repeat that lifting a certain number of times. So I'm going to lift a certain number of times when I go to gym on a given day. I'm going to go back to the gym a certain number of days a week for a certain number of weeks for a certain number of months, depending on how big I want that muscle to go. So I'm going to be repeating it. I'm going to be repeating it over a set amount of time. I'm going to repeat it at a certain amount of intensity. So if the weight that I'm lifting is too light, I'm wasting my time. I'm just going to be sitting here flapping my arm around. If it's too heavy, I'm not even able to get it off the ground and I'm wasting my time. So it's got to be just the right weight that I'm able to lift it up and move it. And then that salience piece is that specificity, is that specificness, which is making sure I'm actually targeting the muscle that I want to target. And so that means that I need to make sure I'm lifting the weight in the correct way. I'm not just going like this or like this or moving it in a different way so that I'm not working the muscles that I intend to work. And that often takes place through some coaching or specificity of the task that I can get, uh, that I'm engaged in. 
Um, when you go to a gym, sometimes you find now that a lot of folks don't even use free weights anymore. You use like machines where you're actually, uh, it's sort of uh, directing the way you use it. That's because that helps increase that salience, that specificity of the task. Because when we use free weights, there's a lot more mistakes that we can make as individuals. Whereas the technology of those big machines that we wrap around us and then start rowing or doing whatever it is we're doing, kind of confines us a little bit and makes sure that we're actually exercising the muscle we want versus a free weight that really requires a coach or some kind of training to use. So these four conditions are what help us to really change the brain, build the brain, and see that maximum impact of change that we might want to see through an intervention or through an activity that we're engaged in. And computer games provide us with a unique forum to engage all four of these things. So working from just brain science, even before I get into learning and motivation, just the brain science alone really supports use of computer games or computerized platforms as a forum for engaging in activities with a sufficient repetition over enough time. There needs to be a sufficient level of intensity. That means the activity that I'm exercising has to be hard enough, but not too hard and not too easy. So just sort of in that sweet spot where I'm getting good exercise for the brain, but I'm not being lazy with my brain and I'm not overworking it, so I'm just stressing the brain. So there's gotta be that sweet spot of intensity where I'm matching. And salience, and what salience means is that stimulus or what I'm trying to exercise really stands out. So it's really clear. It's like I'm really focusing on a muscle group. So if I were to compare this to something like weightlifting for a muscle in my body, I would say, okay, if I want to grow this particular muscle, then I have to repeat. I'm going to lift this weight a certain number of times. I've got to repeat that over a certain period of time in order to see this muscle start growing. It's not going to be that I'm going to go out, weightlift for half an hour, walk out of the gym, and I'm going to look great. Well, I probably would, but that's not alone going to do it. Yeah, I wish. Everyone laughs. Nice. Um, I need enough time. I need enough intensity. If that weight is too heavy, I'm not going to be able to lift it up. If it's too light, I'm just kind of wasting my effort. So it needs to be the right weight that I'm working the muscle that that muscle can grow, but not so heavy that I can't grow it. And salience, that means that it's got to be very specific to the stimulus. So if I'm trying to grow this muscle and I'm lifting my weight like this, is that muscle going to grow? Probably not because I'm not working, I'm not, I haven't focused on it. So a lot of times when people are serious about weightlifting, they'll actually go to a trainer and they'll watch the way they're lifting the weight and they'll say, oh, your arm's a little too far this way or a little too far this way. And they'll coach them around exactly how to lift that weight so they can really isolate that specific muscle and make sure that that stimulus, that area of focus is really honed in. So same rules apply to the brain. When we're doing exercise, we're trying to focus on areas of the brain, we're also looking at how closely we can tailor and focus that exercise so that we're isolating that specific area of the brain with that same level of focus as we might if I'm trying to isolate a muscle for exercise and weightlifting. And one of the things we know based on brain science is these things can change the brain. And we see changes in brain as a result of these kinds of activities. And we know that one of the ways that we can um, engage in this kind of activity is through computer games, as I note on the slide there. But before I kind of step into that a little bit more, I'm going to go through a couple more theories that further underscore these ideas, looking at both learning theory and motivation theory. And then we're going to come back to thinking about computer games and why this is a good fit. Another area we can think about is learning theories. And anyone who's um, done any kind of psych courses at any point, whether it's in high school or um, any college or any courses like that, you might recognize some of these, these folks because they're pretty well known. And one of them, his name is Vygotsky, and he's a learning theorist. And he's somebody who really believed in learning by interacting. And you might say, geez, Jackie, you're talking about learning by interacting. We're talking about computers. But computers really do provide us with an interactive framework. And one of the things that they allow us to do that Vygotsky really talked about um, is create a really nice zone of proximal development that allows for good scaffolding. What that means, zone of proximal development means, means that zone, that area where learning is optimized. So Vygotsky did a lot of study and a lot of research and he said, if I can get somebody into this zone, then I will find that they will learn the maximum amount of material. They will be at their very best. They will learn the most. They will retain it. They will be able to use it. They will be able to apply it. But we got to find that zone, sweet spot. 
Sounds a lot like the intensity from the brain plasticity, doesn't it? Yeah. Same concept. Just one came from a brain scientist and one came from a learning theorist. Same basic ideas, two different fields of study saying the same thing. Find the sweet spot, learning is maximized. The second thing that Vygotsky said was scaffolding. And that means if I help somebody to learn a little bit, if I give them some strategies, if I kind of coach them around the learning, they're going to be able to kind of climb that up a little bit better. They're going to be able to scaffold their learning and, and increase that learning. So if I sort of identify strategies or help point out strategies, I'm essentially giving them a leg up. Again, kind of like coaching. So when we're talking about salience and helping to identify what I'm working with, how to make sure I'm targeting the right stimulus to the right area, it's kind of like we're talking about scaffolding again. How I sort of give somebody a bit of a leg up, a little direction, so that they can best access their learning within that zone of proximal development. So again, same ideas. We want to find that sweet spot of learning, and we want to be able to support learning within that where I can get some nice uh, feedback in terms of when I'm doing it right and how accurate I am in my learning. Piaget, who's another learning theorist who talked about, about learning, and in fact, a lot of stuff, anyone in schools, a lot of our educators, a lot of the teachers in the schools, Vygotsky and Piaget, they hear about them. If you're, you go into a school, you talk to one of your kids' teachers, if you've got kids, or if you are an educator who's listening to this, these are names that you guys know and know well. And one of the things that Piaget talked about is that we learn best by doing, by engaging. The kids who can be active in their learning as opposed to passive are going to do their very best. So if I'm sitting back and just absorbing information, kind of like we're doing today actually, it's okay, but it's not a great way to learn. What would be better is if we can get into back and forth. And so today, even at the end of today, we're going to have questions and answers. And that's a better opportunity for learning. So even as you're listening to me right now, if you're saying, hmm, I'm wondering this or I'm wondering that, and you're starting to jot down questions or think about things you're thinking about, then you bring those up at the end and we have a discussion about it, that's going to maximize your learning because then you're starting to do something and you're starting to engage. Just listening, we don't learn as much. And Piaget knew that. And so we know that if we want to help somebody to learn well, we need to get them engaged. They need to do something. We are active learners and we are best when we can be active, experimenting, trying new things. All of these pieces, again, can be attained through the use of gaming and computers and technology in, in terms of how we can use it with kids. The last piece I'm going to talk about is sort of motivation theory. And this is another big one, is if we want to work with kids, if we want to work with adolescents, even if we want to work with adults, maybe even especially if we want to work with adults. Do you guys know, non sequitur, that the biggest use of video gaming and gaming technology nowadays is in kids and adults over 50? and they're matched in terms of use frequencies. So I know, mouths are dropping in front of me right now. So if we wanna keep talking about gaming and you guys are thinking, oh, Jackie's just talking about the kids again because I like to talk about the kids. Truth be told, there's actually a bit of a bimodal, so we get two peaks. The time that we don't game as much is sort of our 30s and 40s because we're too busy running around chasing the children who are doing the gaming. But once we don't have to chase the children anymore, we get right back on those games. Let me tell you, it's amazing, the numbers. Gaming is motivating. And why is motivating important to in learning? Well, it engages us. We pay attention to it. We focus on it. We want to pay attention. We all know that when we're bored and we're like going, la, 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 we're not getting a whole lot in our head. But when I'm interested, when I'm engaged, something's happening. I'm starting to connect the dots a little bit. Rewarding. If I want to learn, if I want to be motivated to learn, if I want to be motivated to try something new, take a risk, do something that might be a little bit hard. I'm in that sweet spot, so it's got to be a little bit hard. There's got to be a reward. What am I going to get for this? You know, and that reward can be anything. It could be a little trophy, a virtual trophy I put on a virtual shelf. It could be a little bing, 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 bing that I get off my computer. Rewards can be a lot of different things. But rewards help us to push through things that are a little bit more challenging and motivate us. Learning needs to be accessible. I need to feel as though I can do this and access what I need in order to succeed at the task. If I feel like it's too far out of reach, I'm not going to try it. If that activity, if that possibility is not accessible, I'm not going to try. Back to our sweet spot again, hey? It needs to be in that sweet spot. When I'm in that sweet spot, when I'm getting the rewards and I'm engaged, I can have experiences of what we call self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is a fancy way of saying, hey, guess what? I can actually do this. 
and that feels good. And the minute I say to myself, hey, I might be able to do this, I'm willing to try the next thing. If I have success here, I tried, I worked, it was hard, but I pushed through it, and guess what, I actually did it. Then I feel like, gee, I'm gonna try and push through the next time because I have greater self-efficacy. I have greater confidence in my own ability to do something. And another key piece when we're thinking about motivation and what motivates us is clarity in my goal. Do I know what I'm actually trying to do? Little bit like salience. How do I, do I know what I'm gonna do? Sort of that goal clarity and accessible, get us back to those ideas of salience and, and scaffolding and that sweet spot where I need to have a really clear idea of where I'm going and how I'm gonna get there. So putting all this together, I've talked to you here a little bit in a nutshell, I've pretty much given you guys like, you know, three different lectures that we do in psychology on how the brain and how uh, learning and how motivation all contribute to the way we, we take risks and want to learn new tasks. So this is the nutshell version of, of all of these theories. But what's interesting is that these theories overlap in huge ways. Motivation theory people sit over here. Learning theory people sit here. And brain uh, scientist people sit over here. Yet they're all saying the same kinds of things. They're all telling us the same kinds of things. So we need to listen. And we think, well, how do we do this? If we know that all these people are telling us that it's really important to find a sweet spot, just a sufficient level of challenge, where there's reward, where there's support, where there's a clear goal, where they can practice and practice it, not get bored by it and stay engaged, what am I going to do? Let's say I want to engage, I don't know, a 15-year-old kid and have them do something over and over and over again where they're rewarded and they have to try new things and they have to take risks. How am I going to do that? Well, games set us up beautifully for that. Technology sets us up beautifully for that. Technology allows us to engage kids. It allows us to engage kids in things that can be rewarding, where goals are clear, where level of difficulty is set by performance. So they attempt tasks, they attempt tasks. When they succeed, they bump up a little bit. Then they succeed, they bump up. So they keep getting that scaffolded sort of one up after another. Those levels adjust based on their performance. They know exactly what their goal is to get there. When we add on layers of coaching and support, we increase the salience and the skills that they have and provide more support in achieving this. This is not to say that technology is the end all be all and that we should all run out, put our kids on video games and have them play more often. Um, rather, what I wanna set as a framework here is that technology and, and specifically I'm talking, I know a lot about gaming and I'm gonna get, expand a little bit beyond this in a minute, but technology does provide us with the opportunity to access some of the knowledge around learning in a way that is new to us. Doesn't mean we just need to take it hook, line, and sinker. But it does mean that we can say, we know that we can optimize outcomes in these ways. Let's see what we can take advantage of the tools available to us. Let's use them. Let's hone them. Let's tailor them. And so we look at how we can develop and build on those. And that's a great way to engage kids. And it helps us to engage kids in things like um, brain change, which is intervention strategies we're talking about. But we can do other things with it. And, and Carmen's gonna talk to you a little bit about um, ideas around diagnosis, which show us about technology and how it can give us information that we can't otherwise get because it allows us to be far more specific and far more precise in our understanding. Also, when we use games or technology to engage kids, we can get them to engage in different tasks that we couldn't do before. So sometimes they'll persist with different kinds of activities and tasks that they weren't otherwise willing to do, which helps us to better understand the population. So we tap into how different areas of the brain work. And we're able to say, their brain does not do this very well, and it's not just because they're not engaged or they're bored. It's actually because they're trying really hard and it's not working for them. And so we learn a lot through use of games. So not only is it about changing the brain, but it's also they give us the ability and technology in general can give us the ability to increase our understanding. When we wrap up today and talk about communication, much like today's presentation, we can talk about how technology when thought of entirely different provides us with ways to connect with one another. And that's an entirely different framework. But to begin with, I wanted to introduce us to the idea that when we talk about technology, we are talking about something that is well grounded in some basic ideas of learning and what can support our learning, whether it be intervention learning or communication learning like we're doing here today.
in terms of how it's been used and what we see with the science that's behind it, two populations, we've seen a lot of work around ADHD and autism in terms of use of technology. And I'm just gonna talk briefly about both. But one of the things that we do, and, and this is something Carmen and I do a fair bit of, is we try not to reinvent the wheel. So I've just established that technology can be a useful tool for us, particularly in terms of engaging and understanding and providing intervention services. But for Carmen and I, it's like, well, we could just jump out and try new things, or we can take a look at other populations, see what they're doing, what's working for them, and then apply it to a more specific population, for instance, FASD, as you'll hear more specifically about today. But before we get to the specific population, I'll just give you a couple ideas of the, some of the work that's being done with these two groups um, to give us some of those ideas that we move forward for. So one thing, and this is something um, that's been done for a while now and has become um, fairly well supported, and that's the use of biofeedback with uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So attention deficit hyperactivity disorder are kids who have difficulty um, sustaining attention for a long period of time, um, inhibiting their responding, sitting still, all of these kind of basic abilities. What biofeedback does, it is a process of gra gaining greater awareness. So they're gaining awareness of their bodies or of functions in their bodies using some kind of instrument that's providing them with feedback and then helping them to manipulate it. So sometimes this looks like they'll wear little hats that have little... Um, receptor type things on it that actually give them sort of feedback about where what the electricity is doing in their brain, what their, what their brain is kind of firing on. And so if they're playing a task and they're starting to get distracted, sometimes that task will sort of fade out on them or it'll change when their brain waves start to show that their attention is going. And so if they want to continue doing their task, they have to figure out how to refocus that attention so the task can come back on. So they're getting this sort of physical salient, right, that clear, concrete, salient feedback as to whether or not their attention is going, as to whether or not that screen starts to fade. And then they start to focus in their attention again and their brain waves identify it again, and they can practice that. So you think, wow, that's, that's kind of cool. And once again, that's the kind of task that they need to be doing over and over and over again so that they can learn that skill when they don't have an actual computer screen or something like that fading in front of them. And so that's some of the things that are done. And with ADHD, it's actually one of those areas that, I mean, biofeedback is used with a large number of populations, large number of groups. It's been talked about for years and years and years. Okay, I'm exaggerating. It's been talked about for years. Um, I say years and years and years because in the world of technology, it's probably one of the older ones, um, which is still not that old because a lot of the stuff is fairly new. But it, it's probably one of the best established uses of bio, biofeedback. That being said, you still want to look really carefully at anything you use. So even as I talk today, I, I, I always have to throw in caveats and say, look carefully, ask a lot of questions. Um, just because it's technology and just because it's biofeedback doesn't mean it's an end-all, be-all. None of these are magic pill kind of responses. Anything that we talk about today are supports or are ways that we get more information or ways that we increase or improve function. That Nothing is a cure-all. Nothing is about making everything all better. And even with biofeedback, there are approaches to biofeedback that work better than others. Biofeedback where there's a coach involved, where somebody is sort of saying, hey, when that screen starts to go, maybe you can do this in order to help rein in your attention. Or maybe this might help. Works even better than kids who have to generate strategies on their own. So if they're coached around strategies, they do better than when they're not. Another approach to technology, so that's ADHD and biofeedback. Um, is with autism, and this is relatively new, uh, much newer than biofeedback. I sort of just picked a couple of things here, one that was a little bit older and one that's much newer. And um, this is the use of video games with autism and, and particularly the use of virtual environments. And vir use of virtual environments is something we're seeing more and more of lately. And this is where you take on a character, we often refer to as an avatar, and you are that avatar in some virtual environment. So you're playing on a computer, and you see yourself wandering around on the computer and you interact with people and you either use a, um, a mic to speak to people or type in your, your instructions to your character. Different things are available to different people. What they've done within the autism community in, in this particular study that I speak to, which is more as a pilot study, this is very emerging kinds of information, but they've created um, social environments for kids to interact in to practice different social skills. 
what they're finding, and this is really interesting, and this has been found in a few groups, and I, I name autism in one particular study here, but there are other groups this has been found in, is that when you go in and do this to learn social skills to interact, is it's in vivo enough or it's real enough that the kids kind of immerse themselves in it. So it's really kind of close to reality that they're actually practicing skills in a way that feels more real or more closer to life than if we were doing sort of a social skills group or a get together group. They can do it still where they're supervised and coached from the outside so they're still getting guidance in a way that you could never provide in a real life environment. And they've got a little bit of anonymity so they're not as scared of rejection and they don't have the same level of anxiety in that interaction. So they're willing to risk engaging in new patterns of interaction with folks that can allow them to practice new styles of interacting without any of the fear and anxiety. And so if they do this and they practice and practice and practice it in these virtual environments, they can then take those skills and believe it or not, they do have a translation value into the way they then interact with others. So it's close enough to real life that if they practice enough in that virtual environment, there does appear to be some transfer into what they're doing in real life. So there is some evidence of improved social skill, which is really kind of cool. Um, and certainly far more than we're seeing from things like a lot of times, particularly with disability populations or populations with greater challenges, when we do things like social skills groups, we put a group of five kids in a room and we talk about how do we talk nice to each other, we do these social skills modules, we don't see as much transfer. We see way more anxiety in the group, we have a lot more group dynamic risks, and we don't necessarily see transfer because they're sitting in a group staring at each other and they're not getting the level of repetition, remember how hard, important repetition is? We may not be getting that sweet spot of learning because all five of them may learn slightly differently and so one sweet spot for one kid may not be the same as a sweet spot for another kid. But if I put all five of them in a virtual environment, we get rid of the anxiety. They can each have a slightly different sweet spot because the game can tailor itself to each of them and create slightly different and unique challenges for them. We can have some nice scaffolding of tasks where they get harder for them at independent levels, depending on what those kids need. So it gives us this increased control and much more transferability because the virtual environment approximates real world living far more than our typical group contexts. This is what they're telling us. I know. It's, 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 it's really interesting to see and there's some really interesting learning coming from it. Um, still lots to learn and there's still lots of questions and things that we don't know. Again, none of these are end all be alls and I'm going to talk a bit more about virtual environments later on today. but. Uh, what's exciting is there are neat things happening that are really looking closely at why is this working? Could this be working in a way that helps us to advance our understanding and advance the way we provide supports to kids? Yeah, yeah. Doesn't mean we just do whatever. We really need to be careful, we need to be strategic, and we need to be thoughtful, but it's kind of exciting. The science is there with the other populations, in the theory, in our understanding of brain, it's there. So knowing all of this, we say, well, we need to bring this to the FASD population. This is exciting. This is the kind of work that we want to look at. So Carmen's now going to take us uh, specifically to FASD and talk a little bit about diagnosis, uh, understanding, and intervention stuff with FASD. Thank you, Jackie. OK, I'll take over um, from here for a bit and then turn it back over to Jackie. So I'll be talking about some use of technology that helps us further understand what is affected in FASD and then also how technology is used to intervene or for interventions for FASD. So I'll, we'll talk briefly about um, technology being used in the diagnosis or the assessment of FASD, um, talk a bit about MRI research and, and the use of technology there, that's brain imaging research and some eye movement re research that's looking at basic inhibitory control that's using a really interesting, innovative um, technology. So in the FASD diagnosis, um, Susan Astley and her group at the University of Washington in Seattle have actually developed um, an FASD, an FAS facial photographic analysis software where you can actually take a picture of the face and it can with a computer, you upload it onto a computer, it can measure some of the key facial characteristics of fetal alcohol syndrome. So those are the palpebral fissure length, which is the, the length of the eye slit of the eye, 
the philtrum, which, which is the, the little indent above um, the lip, and the thinness of the upper lip. So it's a really interesting use of technology. So as you can see here, um, this is directly from their website, and, and Dr. Astley sent, sent me this image. Um, it's quite, it, it's interesting, a, a picture is taken, the, the picture of the face is uploaded, and the computer automatically computes a four-digit face, facial score. So as part of the FASD assessment, everybody um, is measured on the, on the facial characteristics and a four-digit score is calculated for them. Now remember that only a small proportion of children with FASD actually have all of the facial features because that occurs when there's exposure during a, a, a period of vulnerability early in the first trimester, but it still is very, very useful for those individuals that do have the facial characteristics. So it measures those characteristics, uploads it into computer, and the computer comp computes the score. And actually what they have found in their research that the computer is more accurate than the actual hand measurements because hand measurements can be subjective, okay? And, and there's a lot, there are things that can be left up to the interpretation of the person that's measuring them, but the computer is not subjective and they're actually more accurate. So it's a very interesting use of technology that is improving diagnostic and assessment for FASD. Are we good? We're good? Okay. So just recall that the face is only affected in a small proportion of children, but it is useful um, for measuring those facial features. Sorry, the website is listed here um, where you can find out more information on their facial analysis software. It is just used by dog diagnostic teams. I wanna talk a little bit about brain imaging because brain imaging really uses advanced technology to help us understand FASD. So some of the early studies are looking at structural imaging in FASD where you're looking at the structures of the brain and um, that has produced some useful findings but in the end it turns out that a lot of individuals with FASD do not have major structural abnormalities to their brain and so we have to use even more advanced technology, more advanced brain imaging techniques to, to look at some of the more subtle changes in the brain and so one of those is fMRI and that's functional magnetic resonance imaging and that basically looks at the areas of the brain that are activated when you're doing a cognitive task. So it actually measures the blood flow to certain areas and that has really advanced our understanding in FASD. Um, we do see abnormal activation in FASD and we also see individuals with, that, with FASD having to recruit more brain areas to do a cognitive task compared to control individuals in that they kind of have to involve more areas of the brain because the tasks are more challenging for, for them. So both structural imaging and fMRI um, ha have been around for quite a while and there's a fair bit of research in FASD looking at those types of imaging. Something that's more innovative and, and more a newer area of research is looking at diffusion tensor imaging. And this is something that we've been conducting research on for about the last 10 years here in Alberta. Um, we collaborate with a, an expert on DTI, Christian Villio at the University of Alberta. And what DTI does, it's, it's quite different and, and, and it is really kind of a new hot area of research. 10 or 15 years ago, there weren't a lot of papers on it. There were only a handful of papers on FASD and now there are a number. What DTI does is it maps out the white matter connections in the brain. So it's looking at the, the connections in the brain and the pathways in the brain. And what you can do with DTI is you actually get pictures of the actual connections and pathways in the brain. So this is where I'd love to be able to point and show. But as you can see on this slide is um, the tracks are not in color in the brain. They're colored here um, to make it ease um, to differentiate them. But we can actually map out the connection of the corpus callosum, what connects our right half with our left half, um, the cortical spinal tract, a bunch of different white matter tracks in the brain, which are really important for transferring information from one area of the brain to another. And this is a very non-invasive MRI procedure. The individual just lays in the machine for about 20 minutes and you can get these beautiful pictures of the white matter tracks. So it's really interesting, this new technology to actually be able to to look at the tracks inside of our brain. And so this is one of the first studies that we published on this in 2008. And like I said, when we published this first study, there were two other papers, I believe, looking at DTI and FASD. So it was very, very new, new stuff. And now, now there, are, there are a number of papers published on this. We measured 10 major white matter tracks. And we actually found that seven of the 10 tracks showed significant differences in the, 
in the integrity of the tracks um, compared to controls. And that was either on one side or both sides of the brain. So that was really 70% of the tracks that we measured, we were showing significant differences. Although when you look at structural imaging, a lot of these kids had normal structural imaging. So we have to use the, the really the more advanced technology to look at more of the subtle changes. And this is where we really find a lot of differences in FASD. So it's a really interesting area of research. And um, Dr. Bullio is even doing some more advanced stuff now, um, looking at um, potentially looking at scanning on even higher magnitude um, scanners as well. So there's even more growth that can be done in this area. We can actually correlate, or we can um, attempt to correlate um, how the individuals are doing cognitively with some of the measures of white matter integrity. And one thing that we found in, in, in one of our studies is that one of the areas of the brain that's, that's known to be highly involved in mathematics, which we know is affected in FASD, it's one of the, the weakest academic areas, um, the tracks coming in and out of that area of the brain, we actually found that um, the, the integrity of those tracks was highly correlated with their math scores. So it's a really interesting way to show that what we're seeing cognitively and um, with the individuals is actually correlating with what we can measure using advanced technology to look at the actual structure and integrity of their brains. So that's um, just going to highlight that. that. That's basically all I'll talk about, about diffusion tensor imaging. Um, if people want to email me for more references on it, there are a lot of different studies that have been conducted now, and I'm happy to share those. I'm just including the reference here for the first paper done on it. The next thing I want to talk about is saccadic eye movements. So this is a really interesting area of research that was started by James Reynolds at, Queen, at Queen's University. So saccades are fast coordinated movements of the eyes. So basically, as we're, we're looking right now, everybody's scanning the room, you can see something going off over here and your eyes are constantly moving and your eyes are really an extension of your brain. And so we can measure how coordinated our eyes are in, in, in moving and scanning the environment. And there's an overlap in the areas of the brain that are affected by prenatal alcohol exposure and those that are involved in controlling saccadic eye movements. So the prefrontal cortex is a big one, um, the caudate, thalamus, and the cerebellum. So all of these areas that are affected by prenatal alcohol exposure are also involved in coordinating our saccadic eye movements. So James Reynolds collaborated with an individual who, who is an expert in saccadic eye movements to come up with a, a way of measuring them in fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Nobody had ever done this before, but they thought there could be something here if we look at the saccadic eye movements, because it's really a direct measure of, their, uh, of their, their, their brain functioning as well. And they're actually very easy to measure. It's non-invasive, and it, it's really not making them ideal for use in children. So basically what you do is you have the individual look at, look at a computer screen, and they just wear special glasses that come out front that measure their eye movements, and it's very accurate. You can get m measures of errors and, and reaction time, and it's a very interesting way to use advanced technology to look at this. So I'm gonna take you through one of the tasks that are used to measure saccadic eye movements, and this is from James Reynolds' original research looking at this, the first ever papers published on this in FASD. So in this task, in the pro saccade task on the, I guess it, my left, is it on the left there? on the left side of the screen, yeah. Um, the individual um, sees a green dot in the middle of the screen. This will be a little bit difficult to do without being able to point. And then they're told that a white dot will appear, and when it appears, they have to look towards the other dot. So they're staring at the green dot. When the other dot appears, look towards it. And then you can directly measure the movement of their eyes, how fast they move their eyes, and whether or not they make mistakes. Okay, that's the pros like task. The anti saccade task on the other side of the screen, they're looking at a red dot and they're told now um, a white dot is going to appear, but when that appears, look away from it. So they actually have to inhibit their response to look towards the target and look away. So it really involves that basic inhibitory control, which is one of the core executive functioning deficits in kids with FASD. So having to look away from a target is much more difficult. And again, we can measure their errors and their reaction time. Now there's two different conditions that this is done in. There's an overlap condition where the second dot appears before the first dot goes away. And then there's a gap condition where there's a 200 millisecond gap between 
um, the first dot disappears before the second dot appears. So there's different parameters that you can get here. But it's a very interesting way to look at this control of the eye movements and look at this basic inhibitory control. So in their original study, this is what they found. Um, this was their original pilot study, the first ever study published on this in 2007. So what they found in controls, um, what you can see here is, I'm not sure if I should point over there, but basically controls. Um, the blue line, the, the, the wider blue line is where the target appears. And then they're supposed to, this is the anti saccade task where they're supposed to look away. And as you can see, almost all of them change their eye movements to look away. So you can see how the, I don't know, Jazz, if you can point there, but here. yeah, oh, I can do it here. So they all change their eye movements to look away. There's a few that make a couple mistakes here, but then they self-correct. And, and so they do it quite well, okay? And this is the most difficult task. They wanted to see whether or not this could differentiate kids with FASD from controls, but also from children with ADHD, because children with ADHD have difficulties with, with impulsivity, with inhibition and, and attention. So what they found in kids with ADHD is very interesting. When the, the second target appeared, many made mistakes, and they actually reacted faster. They actually reacted sooner than the controls because they have this impulsivity problem. And uh, many of them look towards the target, but then they were able to self-correct and look away. So yes, they had that initial impulsivity, they looked towards the target, but they self-corrected and then looked back. So, th so they did okay. FASD is very interesting. There's a couple things I want to point out here. The first thing is, what do they do when the target appears? They do nothing because they have a delay in their processing speed. They, they, it takes them so much longer to react than a child with ADHD or that a control participant. Although this is just milliseconds, this is a significant delay in their processing speed. And we talk about them having a um, difficulty processing information, a slower processing speed, and this is a direct measurement of it. The control of their eye movements is actually delayed, which is really, really interesting. The second thing to point out is, not only is it delayed, they're all over the place. They're looking towards, away, and the ones that do look towards the tar target, many of them don't self-correct. They're really all over the place. They're making much more errors and much more direction errors. And so what they found is that this task, using this advanced technology, was able to differentiate FASD from controls, but also FASD from children with ADHD. And that's really, really compelling because it, in a lot of our tests, there's a lot of overlap in, in a lot of the cognitive difficulties that are affected in FASD and ADHD. So this is a really interesting use of technology to show this. So James has gone on to do a lot more further studies on this. We participated in the second study on this. And so this was a first study um, conducted in Ontario, and then he conducted a second national study where they recruited children from all over Canada from a number of different sites, had a much higher sample size. I think we had close to 200 participants. But again, we, we showed the same findings, that this advanced technology was able to differentiate children with FASD from controls. Now, of course, this isn't going to be a diagnostic tool that you can just measure their eye movements and, oh, they have FASD. You still need to, um, to look at it with the whole battery of cognitive tests that you would do in an assessment. And right now, this isn't being done in diagnosis. I mean, it does have maybe a potential to be used in screening for FASD, but there, we still need more research on it. But it is showing how this advanced technology can really improve our understanding of FASD. And it's very difficult to get findings like this on our cognitive tests that we do. It's such a discrimination between the groups. So it's a really interesting use of technology. Um, we have further gone to show in, in the National NeuroDevNet study that um, now we're looking at how the control of eye movements correlates with behavioral measures of inhibition and cognitive measures of inhibition. And we're showing that it very strongly correlates with an actual cognitive test of inhibition, which again validates what we're measuring in the brain and in the controlling of the eye movements is correlating with the cognitive deficits they're showing on behavioral tests. So that's really interesting as well. So that's where that line of research is going. And I think it's, I think it's really compelling and a really neat use of technology. The next thing I want to talk about, I'm going to talk a bit about one intervention project and then I'll hand it over to Jackie to talk about another one. Um, we're going to kind of switch gears now and talk a little bit about more about interventions. So, so far we've been talking about the use of technologies to help understand disorders. 
um, I'm going to talk a bit about interventions that are used. So the first one I'm going to talk about is a fire safety program. So Clara Coles and, and her colleagues at the University at Emory University in Atlanta developed a computerized virtual reality game to teach fire safety to kids with FASD. Very interesting, um, a very important skill to teach and, and I'm sure you can guess that in, individuals with FASD may have difficulty with some of the fire safety things involving rules, steps, planning, all of these things that we know, these cognitive abilities that are affected that could really have a dramatic impact in a real world situation if, if they're in a situation with a fire. So they developed a virtual reality game to teach fire safety. They originally piloted it with five children, age five to seven with FASD, and they tested them before the game. So basically they played this computerized game um, to learn fire safety steps. Before they played the game, none could correctly identify the steps the correct steps that you need to take when there is a fire. Then they played this game that helped them teach the steps and learn the rules. And after they played it, all of them were able to complete the safety steps. And then they actually came back a week later and they found that they, the results were still maintained in a real life simulation one week later. So this is what it looks like. It's a virtual reality game that uses this the bottom one here is the fire that uses this dog and it teaches them about fire safety and the kids found it very engaging. They love playing these types of games. And so their original pilot study with the five children was very successful. They then expanded it to street safety. Another very, very important skill to teach kids with FASD, street safety. They expanded it to street safety and included much more, a, a much higher sample size, and again found that it was effective in street safety and fire safety. So it's a really interesting use of technology to teach essential skills that are really important for kids. And so I think um, this has a lot of, of great potential and um, really can you know, help save a person's life if they're in a situation where, where they could be faced with these dangers. So really interesting use of technology. And if um, there are some websites that are available um, for, from the individuals that developed the technology, if people do want to email me, I'm happy to share those with you as well, um, where you can get more information and they have other activities that they have on there that are available for, for children, not just with FASD, but for a wide variety of developmental disabilities. So I'm going to end here about the fire safety and I'm going to hand it over to Jackie talking about some of the more cognitive interventions that are used to improve cognitive functioning in FASD. Thanks Carmen. Um, fantastic, thanks. So yeah, as Carmen um, said, you know, when we're looking at uh, intervention approaches, we can come at it from different directions. We can say we want to provide an intervention that works with some of the underlying skills. So Carmen talked about how we've learned through technology about the way that um, white matter or the pathways of the brain aren't connected well, how inhibition is an area of problems, um, is a real challenge. And these are things we know well. So we can look at interventions that hone in and focus on those basic skills of inhibition, or we can look at higher level interventions that do things like how do you get through um, how do you cross the street safely? How do you deal with a fire safely? So our intervention efforts kind of work at different levels and have different goals attached. And this comes back to really knowing the goals. And I think as we talk about technology, we talk about understanding and intervention, we, we've gained a lot of understanding around FASD. And one of the things is we know it's a, it's a very complex disorder. And there are a lot of different challenges. And some of those are challenges that are very functional day to day that we're dealing with. And in other times, um, we're trying to just improve a more generalized function by dealing with some of these cognitive abilities. So anytime you're thinking intervention or anytime we're talking about it, one of the things that Carmen and I often come back to is, what is the goal of your intervention? What are you trying to accomplish? And I would encourage anyone who's thinking about interventions to really think about what is that goal. Um, if your goal is something that's very real life and functional, then there are some things that are out there. If I want you know, somebody to cross the street safely, then there are things that we can look at versus um, the kind of technology I'll talk about now, which is trying to help some more of those underlying abilities that won't have as, um, won't have the same kind of specific impacts, but have more generalized overall impacts. So 
Caribbean Quest is a game, and I've, I've talked about this game before, and so this might be something some of you have heard about, and we'll just talk about it again. But it's a game that is designed to help support basic attentional skills and in inhibition skills. So helping me to pay attention longer, it helps with some basic working memory, keeping things in mind longer, and inhibiting responding, slowing down that responding. These are very cognitive um, level uh, performance tasks, and we're hoping to increase performance across a large number of things. So hopefully we can have somebody who can inhibit their responding a little bit longer and think about it. Um, What's interesting, and I'm thinking about this as Carmen was presenting, is we hear that kids with an FASD um, are actually slower to respond in certain ways. When you look at the saccad tasks that she was showing you, you saw that there's actually a slower response rate. But when they did respond, it was all over the map until you get much further down the map where they finally align. And so one of the things we know with the FASD population is that in real time, because those are milliseconds in real time, they, will, they may respond very quickly, several times wrong before. So we don't see in real time that hesitation period, that, that delay period. What we see in real time is that they respond in multiple directions until they finally can align with the correct response. And that's that disinhibition that she was talking about, the fact that the responding is all over. And so this is the kind of task that we're trying to do in order to target some of that and give them the time and help them to rein in responding a little bit in order to increase sort of that, that point of accuracy and work towards some of those pathways. So what you're seeing on the screen here, what you're seeing is, is just a picture of the game um, as it looks, and you'll see it's quite a brightly colored, fun little game. Here's a couple of the tasks that um, the kids will play. This is a game that we have done with kids aged everywhere from 6 to 16 years old, believe it or not. So this game has been tried with a wide range of kids. Um, we've done this game in a number of different capacities now. Um, it's a game that's been developed by uh, Dr. Kim Kearns in her lab at the University of Victoria, and we've worked in close partnership in terms of um, delivering the game. We've uh, used this game both in Edmonton and in uh, BC, Victoria, uh, and also it is about to be used in Manitoba and Ontario for some uh, further research that is starting right away. Um, so it's been used with kids with an FASD as well as kids with autism and ADHD. And so we have a lot of incoming information on it and are really starting to understand the way in which it's effective. The kids, what they'll do is on the top little game, they will be a little scuba diver. If you can see, um, there's a tiny little green guy in there that I can't point at, but he's there, he's somewhere in the middle. I don't know where the green guy is, but, um, and he's a little scuba diver. And what will happen is on the screen, the kids will see a number of items. One, two, three, four, five items will appear on the screen, sort of in a, in a bar. And they look at those items, and then they have to remember them. They disappear, and they have to swim around through the coral reef and find those items in the same order that they appeared. That's all. And so if they find the right item, it goes bing, bing, bing for every right item. And every time they click on an item and that's either not one that they're seeking or it's in the wrong order, they get a <clears throat> kind of feedback. So it's that immediate feedback reward kind of system. Um, the bottom screen, they're looking for a specific target. And so they're waiting for in the middle window, they want a fish of a specific color or a specific type to come through. Uh, in both tasks, difficulty level increases, the speed of the task increases, the number of items that they need to remember. So these are the kinds of tasks that they're engaged in. The kids love it. They play it forever. It's, it's amazing. These are really simple games, and today in the day and age of, um, you know, um, Call of Duty and all of these kind of high-end video games, I don't know how many gamers are out there watching this, but you'd say, wow, the kids are actually playing this and enjoying it. And it's amazing how engaged they are with the most simple video games. So if they kind of perceive a challenge and they start having a success with it, get that experience of self-efficacy, these games are really very motivating for them. Even at like 15 years old, we're seeing these kids saying, oh, can I just play a little bit longer? What we're looking for when we do these games is not just for them to game, but we're engaging them in both sort of the application of metacognitive skills, self-regulatory skills, and scaffolding, which we've talked a little bit. So we want them to kind of monitor their thinking, think about how they're thinking, think about how they're remembering things. So if I got three items on the screen, how do I go about remembering it? How do I control what I'm remembering? 
So for some of the kids, one of the first things they have to learn when they're playing this computer game and they have to learn it over and over and over again is that when that first screen appears with that top one where they have the four or five items kind of band across is to actually look at them before they hit the space bar to start the task. And I will tell you, hands down, and a lot of you can imagine this, we start working on this game with the kids. They take, the screen pops up, and they just hit the space bar, and then they're surfing their little scuba dude all over the place. And they can't figure out why it keeps going, eh, eh, eh. We're like, well, you know what? Maybe what you need to do is, is control that a little bit, rein it in. And, and, and so we get them to start thinking about those basic inhibitory controls and work with the kids. And we scaffold it. So it starts out step by step and it starts out with those much easier tasks that get harder with time. So we're working with them. You'll hear me keep saying we when I'm talking about these games. And this is a really distinctive component of the kinds of gaming that we're talking about. Whether it be the gaming that Carmen's talking about with the virtual environments or the kinds of more cognitive based tasks that I'm describing um, here is that we're never just sticking kids on games and walking away. There's always some kind of involvement, whether it be coaching at the beginning or end of the task or during the entire game, there is a coaching and co component of some training that's going on. So the kids are not completely autonomous with these games. And that's a huge distinction. These are not games as just sort of, you know, cure-alls that we stick our kids in front of and leave them be and their brains get better. We're actually working with them and that's part of the really crucial part of this is it is, it is a partnership. It gives us a forum to be repetitive and use, get enough intensity and to get kids to keep doing it for a long period of time. All these require components, but they still do their best when we're supporting them through the task to some extent and there's different ways we do that. Children are encouraged to employ additional strategies when their performance is weak. They're encouraged to think about it. So when they keep hitting that space bar before they read the, the band of uh, little things across the top, we say, well, you know what? Why do you think you keep getting them wrong? Well, I don't remember where they are. Well, why don't you remember what they are? Well, I didn't see them. Well, why didn't you see them? Well, they went away too fast. Oh, well, how do you think they could stay on the screen longer? I don't hit the bar so quick. <laughs> Maybe if you, okay, well, then how are we not going to hit the bar so quick? Well, I don't know. I'll sit on my hands. Cool idea. Sit on your hands and look at the screen. Whatever. Let's try it. Let's practice it. You do that enough times over and over and over again, pretty soon you get kids. We have kids where teachers say, they come back to us after and they're commenting on the fact that their kids are always sitting on their hands. And we're like, yeah, no, it's not a bad thing. It's their strategy. Let the kids sit on their hands. They're not doing anything wrong. <laughs> but, you know, so these, these generalize and these are strategies they keep using because they practice them, practice them, practice them, practice them and have success and get reward for trying it. Because then they hit, don't hit the bar, they actually see the screen, they remember them, the scuba guy gets what they want and they hear a whole lot of bing, 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 you're a winner. They feel great. Then they do it again and 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 so on and so on and so on. And eventually, all of a sudden, they don't even think about it and they're sitting in class on their hands because that's what they do. When working with kids, we always teach them kind of like we talked earlier on when we were talking about weightlifting when we're, and, and how the brain changes. We say the same stuff to these kids. This is the kind of stuff. The brain is a muscle, grows stronger with exercise, but we got to make sure the exercise is the right kind of exercise and we got to focus that exercise and we got to practice, practice, practice. And that's what this is all about. And kids like that. They're like, wow, this is practice for my brain? Cool. I mean, we like that, right? When you're doing this stuff or you're playing a game, you think my brain's getting better? We feel good. So do the kids. Well, okay, I feel better. Any help I think my brain is getting makes me feel better. When we're coaching the kids, we do any number of things. And these metacognitive, and when I'm saying metacognitive, it's just thinking about thinking. How we think about thinking, how we use strategies. is like I said, crucial. Because when we're practicing, again, when I'm lifting that weight, I need to know exactly how to lift it so that I exercise the right muscle. If I'm lifting it the wrong way, I'm not exercising the muscle, I'm wasting my time. And that's what these skills uses is about. This is what we're talking about when we're talking about coaching, is we're coaching the kinds of skills so that you're honing what we want you to hone. And, and so some of what we do are verbal. And so if the kids have to remember something in alphabetical order, sometimes we break it right down. We say, oh, the instruction on the screen said alphabetical order. What does that mean? I don't know. Oh, well, what do you do when you don't know what something means? I don't know. Well, can you ask somebody? Oh, okay. So what are you going to say? What does alpha, alpha, alphabetical? <laughs> what does alphabetical mean? These are things we do and we practice it over and over every single time. Okay, practice asking me the question. Practice asking for help. 
practice making sure you understand the instructions, even these basic tasks. Um, let's put down the controller for a minute and read this. And that's the controller. We, we've had, uh, in the past, we've had a controller, like a little Nintendo controller. Sometimes we use computer desk, so it depends on whether or not they're working with a keyboard or a controller. Um, sometimes we teach them just basic memory tasks. So when they're trying to remember things in a certain order, uh, certain visual items, um, one task we had, there was a number of balls that they had to remember in a specific order. So we would say, well, if you're trying to remember soccer ball, baseball, volleyball, what can you do to remember those three? And the kids will work with us to generate strategies. And one of the strategies, one of the kids comes up with, what if they're shorter words? Oh, would that be easy to remember? They're like, yeah, let's try it. Sock, base, vol. Okay, got it. Sock, base. I could say that they're shorter, they're easier. These are things that these kids will help generate when we work with them, when we spend that time to do it. Um, how to list or stack or cluster items into a certain group, how groups are the same. Well, why don't we remember all the animals together and remember all the objects separately? But how do we cluster? Some of these kinds of strategies are things that a lot of us learn over time more naturally. A lot of times when you think back to your schooling, you think back to your training, um, we weren't necessarily taught how to remember things. We were just taught, told to remember things. Nobody ever said, how do you remember things? So over time, we adapt and create certain strategies. We learn that we're rehearsing things over and over in my head helps. So we learn that putting like objects together helps us to remember, OK, I've got to remember three animals and, and three household objects helps me to remember things as opposed to just thinking about six stuff. Those are things that we learn over time. But kids with an FASD often don't. And in fact, not only do they not learn it, they need a lot more repetition to learn it. So if I'm sitting there in a classroom and I'm telling kids over and over and over again that if you shorten the word, it's going to be easier to remember. If you shorten the word, it's going to get easier to remember. They are going to be so sick of me in about two minutes, they won't want to hear anymore. But if they're sitting in front of a video game and practicing that and hearing it over and over and over again, suddenly that ability to get that repeated activity, that, that repeated exposure is possible and they are able to get to a level of learning that sometimes we take for granted in terms of that use of strategies. Physical things we'll sometimes talk about is we'll teach them how to be physical. So we'll use, we can use the screen as well. They can touch the screen. It's not a touch screen, so they're just using it to help organize. They can draw lines between items in order so they can kind of pre-plan a pathway they might want to use. Um, we talk about deep breathing, how do you relax. Again, things that we can practice over and over again. Uh, we talk about how you can count on fingers to make a physical association. So if there's four items on the screen, that's four fingers. So as I'm going through them, I can count down. Again, some basic strategies that we can then practice over and over again in that forum. What we found through using these games is a number of things. Not only have we seen an improvement in some of the cognitive performances, so the ability of these kids to slow down, inhibit their responding until they're able to respond more accurately, but we've seen a lot uh, more use of spontaneous, meaning uh, strategies that they're coming up with themselves, that we're not having to cue. So instead of me saying, oh, what do you need to do to do this well? They're just doing it. They're able to articulate it and they're able to do it. So I need to pause and think I can do this. So the kids will even be working and they'll be getting, starting to get frustrated and all of a sudden you'll see them again, the hands under the butt or they'll put the controller down and they'll go, I need to pause and think I can do this. I need to pause and think I can do this. And they've got a little mantra they start doing or they come up with little things, just like we all do, right? But we see the kids beginning to do these things and we're tracking them. We actually count how often they do it and we see quite an increase in their use of doing it. And we also hear from classrooms and from teachers that these are things that they're taking in with them because they've gotten that degree of practice in a forum using the technology that supported their ability to practice it at the appropriate level of intensity with sufficient reward and motivation, kind of in that sweet spot of learning for enough time that real learning could take place and some of these things just become automized. They become automatic. And so, yeah, and we saw some improvement both in attention in auditory and visual areas. So they're able to pay better attention over a period of time. So that's really exciting and, and some really exciting um, findings for us in terms of the ways that things can be successful and not just successful in terms of that underlying cognitive, but we did see it roll into some of that real world impact.
So I'm going to talk about a couple of things now that are kind of up and coming. And, um, and then we'll talk a little bit about some of the communication strategies before we get into questions and uh, discussion opportunities. So one of the other um, things that we're looking at, and this project is actually starting uh, immediately, almost like this week, as a matter of fact. We finally have all of our approvals. Yay! We're, we're pretty excited about that. Um, is what's called CogMed. And it is a computerized program that works with working memory and helps us to remember and work on how we organize things in our memory. And so again, much like Caribbean Quest, it's working with those basic underlying cognitive skills, but it's definitely working on how we learn and how we manipulate information in our minds. And so this is a project we will be doing with kids with an FASD, as well as um, children with other difficulties, specifically children who were uh, premature at birth and have some other kinds of difficulties. So we can compare the way in which different children respond differently to these kinds of intervention approaches. What we want to learn by doing this and using this technology is not just see how intervention can be helpful with our kids, but whether there are different kids who respond differently to different types of intervention, right? All kids are a little bit different. And so we're really trying to understand a little bit more of the profiles of success. So we can look really closely at the kids before they do the intervention. Then we're going to look after and we're going to say, okay, which kids are really experiencing success? Which areas are we really seeing benefit? So we could be able to eventually say, well, this child with this kind of profile, because FASD is so diverse, so different. Two kids with an FASD could be so different in the way they present. Maybe one of them is going to benefit more from a CogMed type program and another one is going to benefit more from a Caribbean Quest. So we want to slowly gain the kind of knowledge of profile and behavioral functioning through the sensitive computer um, measures that Carmen has talked about, as well as some of our more cognitive and functional measures that we use, so that we can say, when we use these computerized um, interventions, are we seeing that certain skills targeted differently and does that benefit different kids differently, so that we can really tailor the way that we're providing intervention supports. Now, we're in very early days to be doing that, but these are the goals that we have because we think that it's going to help support um, our direction forward. And it is one of the advantages we get from technology is we can increasingly become a little bit more specific and focused in what we're trying to do and hopefully more accurately target what we're trying to target to have the best impact for kids because we don't all have time to do this stuff all the time. So we want to be able to invest in activities that will get us the most benefit for that investment. And so this one is one you can stay tuned and um, CogMed is actually a uh, commercially available product already and so we're using this and, and working in partnership with the CogMed folks as well as um, the Glen Rose Hospital in order to run this project and, and see if this has an effect because, it, like I said, it's already a commercially available product. So that will be really useful. And it's a product that also has some nice demonstrated success with other populations like attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So it's already got some really solid research evidence behind demonstrating it's had that, that it is a program with a lot of success, particularly around those basic inhibition and control areas and, and sort of that organization. Another thing that we're working on, um, and I just lifted this picture, it's not a picture from the actual game, but um, is a, a virtual environment. And building from what I said to you guys a little bit earlier about some of the work in virtual environments that's been done in autism, as well as some of the work Carmen talked about uh, in terms of fire and street safety that's been done with young children with an FASD, we're currently in the process of building a virtual environment for use with adolescents with an FASD, specifically towards social skills development. And so we're hoping to have that virtual environment complete soon. Um, we're essentially developing it in a Mission Impossible theme where we have the kids required as adolescents to work on teams and to work collaboratively on teams with a facilitator pro present, um, but requiring them to accomplish certain social skills goals through the use of this game. And we're hoping to see that we'll have some of the same effects that they did working with other populations with virtual environments, um, as well as just some of the transfer that we know can occur based on the work that Carmen talked about that Claire Coles has done in, in her lab. So we're really excited about this. This is very new, and this is something that I'll hopefully be able to tell you a bit more about. 
um, as we as we kind of build it, these things take an unbelievable amount of time to build. I'm learning more about computers than I ever thought I needed to ever know, <laughs> and I still don't really know anything. But um, it's really interesting. Uh, and definitely we have some real interest by a lot of the kids who think this is a really interesting project and want to have a lot of role in helping us to vet some of the scenarios, which is kind of exciting as well in terms of making it maximally effective. And we really would like to see um, you know, the kinds of social skills interventions that might really have effect in adolescence. We know adolescence is a very high risk time for kids with an FASD. We know it's a time when it's difficult to reach any population, let alone the population with FASD. Adolescents are notorious for wanting to do things their way, their how, and independently without our help. And so really thinking of ways that we can engage adolescents and help to um, mitigate some of those risk factors we see in adolescence is something that's really important to us. And so although I love to see some of the games and some of the work that we're doing with the young kids, and I think that's so crucial, I think that this is a form of technology that's really exciting in terms of an access point to a population that is incredibly hard to engage. And you know, Carmen and I have worked with adolescents in a few different capacities over the years, and they are definitely one of the diff most difficult groups to kind of get in, to participate. Those of you who work with adolescents know exactly what I'm talking about. And so we're really hoping that that engagement piece is going to be a real sell with this. And, and if we can get them engaged, then maybe we can play with it enough until we can try to identify what's going to get us the best outcomes which is sometimes how we do intervention research, particularly with a population that's hard to reach, is first step is we just want them buying in and believing that this is something worth their effort. Once we get that, then we wanna see, okay, now that they're bought in, can we actually make this something that has a benefit for them? And so um, stay tuned, and if you have questions about any of these studies, the COGMED or the virtual environment study, um, uh, Carmen and I have provided our emails, and as Carmen has indicated, we're certainly happy if there are follow-up questions or um, information that you guys are seeking in terms of resources around these studies uh, that we can fill you in on, either things that are done or up and coming. And briefly, I'm just going to review some of the communication things we're doing. As we talk about communication and, and um, Certainly Carmen and I do what we can to try to make ourselves accessible as best we are able. But there are also a few other um, places, if you're not already aware of them, where a lot of up and coming research is uh, promoted and um, uh, distributed and made accessible for feedback, uh, around recruitment sometimes, um, just all sorts of information we try to make available. Um, one of them is a blog, and this is an intervention blog. Um, FASD interventions across the lifespan and you'll see in this blog it posts we post on it probably every couple of weeks so it's not overly frequent but it's a blog where we try to post any current media events any new research studies if there's anything new that's kind of up and coming um, that we think that people might want to be aware of it's available there and there's always places for comments as well so sometimes folks will comment in about something else that they're aware of so really using the blog um, as a, just another opportunity to provide people with information <laughs> because we're certainly seeking information and a way for people to reach out. As Carmen sort of indicated when we're talking about technology, but beyond technology, the world of FASD is expanding rapidly. Those who are provided the services, those who are doing the research in a number of different places. And so one of the biggest challenges sometimes is saying, how do we communicate effectively? How do we keep ourselves from being redundant, repetitive, all doing exactly the same thing? How do we work together and collaboratively in a supportive capacity? Um, as you know, researchers and practitioners, we like to say, how do we make sure that our research is supportive of, of other research, but also ask support to practitioners and our people out there who are working, to families, to caregivers, um, to policymakers, people who are making big decisions around where we want to put funding and what we want to do. How do we link all these sources of information? And so this blog is one way that we really attempt to do that, to say, here's this information, we want to expose you to it and make sure people are aware of what's going on, what's kind of up and coming. And this will be information from all over Canada. This is not, and in fact, often we'll post stuff that's international as well if we think it's relevant. So it's, it's definitely Canadian focused, but we do post for um, the country. Um, the uh, other thing that we have, another thing we have is the No FASD website. This is a website where we're hoping to um, just provide a lot of information around 
uh, functioning in FASD, as well as intervention services and supports that are available. Um, if you go into this uh, site, it's nofasd.ca is the site. And um, you can identify male or female, what age you want to look at. You'll see there's little bullets. These are not intended to be exhaustive, but more examples of the kinds of things you might see. You can read the bullet. For example, the one that's here is, I do not do well in school. So people expect, um, I do well in school, pardon me. So people expect me to do just as well everywhere else, but I can't. So what we've done is we've taken quotes from a number of different individuals we've actually worked with and said, well, why might this be? So for example, if you go into this particular, click on the wiki to learn more, you'll learn about sometimes how school performance and adaptive functioning or executive functioning, as we often talk about, are not the same thing. And that sometimes kids can look good on paper, but not function well in life. And a lot of individuals have seen that. Um, we need to look at the right kinds of skills. And so this website provides that kind of information and then links folks to um, uh, PDFs or other information that you can download, other websites that might be useful. And we're beginning to develop and we'll have done hopefully within the next year um, a searchable database that will take you through programs and services and supports that are available um, beginning with Alberta and Manitoba is also working on this now as well. And so we're hoping to um, have the, this increasing database available. So if you're looking for a certain type of support, you can simply um, type that in and, and find out what's available in your geographic region or in the province, depending on what you're looking for. And so that will all be available through that website. Um, we also have a electronic newsletter, which is the least frequently um, delivered, but it kind of puts information into a succinct um, form and allows us to profile different uh, uh, studies or information. This comes out four times a year, so it's a quarterly electronic newsletter, comes in through your email. Some folks like it because they don't have to go looking for something, it just sort of pops up. You can scroll through it, say what's new and exciting, and then hit delete if you're done. Uh, we will feature things like um, uh, are there opportunities to share research? So if there's researchers doing things, they'll post sort of what their current research is. Um, a lot of times researchers who will kind of do a profile or provide information about their study on the newsletter will also provide their email address. So they're actually trying to, and this is just sort of an example of how folks are saying, I want to connect, I want to communicate. I don't always know how to do it. I don't know how to make myself accessible. So here's one way I'm trying. Here's what my research is. Here's how to contact me if you have questions. So that's information we put in there. Um, we'll put in educational links or resources that you might want to go to. If there are networking opportunities or anything we've heard about, we'll try to profile it. If you have an opportunity or something, we provide this to folks and I say, let me know. We have the technology. We would love to put this information out there. If we can blog something, if we can use the electronic newsletter, we're trying to use technology as a means to which to connect us, to connect us to support, create these systems of support. Connect us, you know, I think this is when I keep saying connect us, it, it just, and, and thinking about technology, I, I think that is one of the unique pieces of technology. Because we can deliver it in such a way and make it accessible um, in a much more unlimited way, we create the opportunity for us to connect regardless of what we do. So that means somebody who um, is a caregiver, a service provider, a researcher, a policymaker can all converse, interact, and share information using technology in a way that otherwise would have never been accessible. You could communicate and connect with people that otherwise you would have never known how to connect with, short of getting in your vehicle or picking up the phone and calling them, which is a lot harder. So this is really something I think that is kind of an exciting opportunity is it gives us one way to start to break down um, some of the barriers that exist and do a better job of creating these systems of collaboration. Oh, and there's the newsletter. Yay, newsletter. And that's a wrap, I think. I'm looking at Carmen, make sure I didn't miss anything. So I think we've got lots of time now for some questions and discussion. Nothing yet on the Q&A form. Can I see no it? questions in here? One of, one of the, uh, one of the uh, things that occurred to me while I was listening to, to the 
a theme that uh, I think was present in both of your presentations was the uh, notion that we're getting better and better at being able to define individual learning styles and with the, and, and in particular the way the brain responds and learns. Um, so do you see a day in the not too distant future when these that this technology will be used to define learning strategies not just for people with some sort of disability but in the general classroom in the in the public school system so that we can can better uh, maximize the learning that takes place there absolutely I really do um, I think something that you know when we're working in the schools and we do try to bring as much of the stuff that we do to schools and work in partnership with schools or communities um, one of the things we're, we're quickly learning is that works what works well with complex populations works well with everybody and good learning is good learning and so some of the messages certainly the level of intensity or specificity that we may bring may not be necessary for all groups but the basic ideas that we're learning around um, how to support um, sort of that um, optimized function I think is going to apply to all kids and, and you know we've been talking to a few groups we've been talking to um, Edmonton Public School Board a little bit about doing some work with their kindergarten classes and we're thinking you know what we want to start doing now is moving into the future is more class-wide intervention where we can and then looking at sort of differential impacts so we can say, all right, how is this benefiting everybody? How does it have sort of a more specialized benefit that maybe if we want to pull things out and tailor it, we can? Um, and again, knowing that technology equips us with this unique scaffolding ability. So what does that mean? Does that mean I can have an entire group of kids sort of working on a task with the same kind of coaching strategies, but each at a slightly different level? Of difficulty because they each have a slightly different ability and each with slightly different task requirements that can vary because the computer can adjust the algorithm to, to that kid so that they're each kind of meeting a unique need while at the same time getting the same global impact maybe I mean I don't know is that overly ambitious probably but um, I, I think that there is some neat potential for that. And I think we're seeing that in already some programs and some classrooms. It's just not well defined. And the way that some of the technology is being used, and, and even if you go into schools now that are all you know using technology, I think we're seeing a lot of things used. I think one of the challenges with technology, as with anything new and kind of sexy, as I keep saying, is that we sometimes put the cart before the horse. And so we sometimes like the idea, we think it sounds really cool, so we throw everything at the idea, we say let's just do this, before we've completed the kind of research to really generate the understanding that allows us to do it really well. So we sort of throw kind of everything at it, and then we go, oh, this isn't as working as well as we thought it would, so let's pull it all back. And I think one of the things that Carmen and I um, work really hard towards is saying, we want to understand exactly why things work, how they work, how they work between groups, before we say, how do we take it to an entire broadband population? I also had a question about um, the this technique that you were using, or the method that you were using with the, the virtual um, social situations. Um, were the kids that were, were performing the tasks virtually, in a group, in a room with a group of other people, they were by themselves. Have you had them do that in a group? I don't, I, we haven't, our virtual, we haven't even done yet. Mm -hmm. The ones that have been done, they've done them, the ones I've seen, anyway, the ones I've read about that are done like this, mm -hmm. I haven't seen them done in a group as yet. Um, so I have no idea how that may or may not change the dynamics. Interestingly, one of the things we are trying right now, to speaking of, of sort of that group um, component is the Caribbean Quest that I mentioned to you. Up until to this point, we've always administered it one on one. So um, most recently, we finished. We trained ex educational assistants within school systems to deliver it to um, kids that they would pull out and, and deliver it to kids in the schools, and, and it worked <coughs> beautifully. But it still comes down to a huge cost, uh, devoting that much time to one-on-one. -on -one. So the uh, extension that I loosely refer to that's going on in Manitoba and Ontario, we're putting the kids in groups 
groups of four with one educational assistant to see. Now, it's not an interactive. This is not a virtual environment game. But it is saying what happens when we put these four kids in the room and talk strategy between them simultaneously while they're tackling these games. How does that change the dynamic? Is that still effective? What does that mean? So, um, and, and clearly if we're then moving that into more of a social skills, that would have an even huger load, huger load. But um, just in terms of even what happens when we put these kids in a room, it, we haven't tried yet. So that's, that, yeah, ask me that in June. <laughs> Okay, so there are no more questions and um, we'll wrap this up. So in closing, I'd really like to thank Jacqueline and Carmen very much for their very uh, strong presentation. It was informative and it provided a strong foundation of knowledge in how technology can inform and support our, our FISD work. Uh, so a couple of uh, other details. Please note that Evaluations will be uh, emailed to participants within the next two business days, so please be sure to sign the attendance sheet. Your feedback on this session is very important to us. As well, um, mark your calendar March 19th uh, when Dr. Vinish Gupta, who is the section chief with AHS Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, will discuss forensic assessment and treatment of individuals for F with FASD. So that's it.